welcome everybody that came out. And let me set this up. All right. Uh, just before you start asking questions, when I enlarge this, I won't be able to see the questions because of the way that this works. You know, if I left it small, I could see the questions. So I'm going to go through this and then I'll ask your questions after I go through it. So with that, let's begin. All right. My name is Glendon Cameron, and this is the Resale Matrix Strategy Webinar. The reason I call it strategy is there will not be any direct tips on how to do eBay or to do Amazon or the, any of those things. Because for me, and this is something that I had to learn, resale is all about the sourcing. And that's what the first two sessions are going to be about. And I'm going to give you the format. First two sessions, formatting, strategy, practical. Third session is going to be infrastructure and then more infrastructure because I made a big leap in how I thought about business when I was in the storage auction business. It was, we bought stuff and it was a great mystery to what we were going to get most of the time. You saw the stuff in the front, but the stuff in the back was always a mystery and that was sometimes a good thing, sometimes it was a bad thing. But we were selling from a position of we got stuff let's go out and make it happen let's sell stuff let's find people who want to buy it what I want to teach you is how to actually find your market first which goes back to the sourcing and then sell it's much easier it's much cleaner and it's not as stressful because essentially what we were doing in the storage auction business which was successful was pushing a boulder up a 90 degree in grade, you know, 90 degree grade, maybe, maybe 110 degrees. I mean, it was like that because we had stuff and we knew it was valuable, but we didn't have the marketplace. We had marketplaces to enter, but we didn't have the marketplace nailed. Uh, my first book taught me that lesson. Well, it reemphasized that lesson that when there's a marketplace, the selling is much easier. So what I want to do for you over these four weeks and then give you some more formatting. What we're going to do is there's going to be, actually it's probably going to be five since this is the first one and this is more of an overview. We're going to have once a week Q&A, live Q&A where you can ask me questions, any questions about resale, anything about the coursework. And inside Hustle University, I will be dropping business knowledge, business ideals. The whole thing's going to be about business, business, business. Like this morning, I put up about the bow tie mo. This little guy, he's 11 years old. He's great. He's got a, a viable. He sold tens of thousands of dollars of bow ties, and he is 11 years old. That's extremely exciting. It's not something that you know people need. It's something. It's very quirky. But he's made the guy. The young man's going to pay. Be able to pay his way through college out of his own earnings, which means he's going to take college much more seriously. And just, you know, aside to that, because someone came at me this weekend about my views on college that I think is a waste of time. Let me be very, very clear. I think going to school, getting fifty dollars to $150,000 in student loan debt for skill sets that will not give you the money to pay that loan back is stupid. If you can get a scholarship, go for it. If you get, you're get you in Georgia and you qualify for the Hope Scholarship, go for it. But otherwise... I am seeing many, many people who are in massive student loan debts and they don't earn enough money to be able to live on their own or they're struggling. So that's my deal. But that's going to be the format. It's going to be weekly Q&As, a ton of business stuff, business ideas. And it's just and it's going to be in a separate tab in Hustling University because everything's going to go. It's just going to be resale matrix. Then all of that stuff is going to go under the tab. There'll be a breakdown. There'll be the webinars and then there'll be cute. You know, that's it, it will be very easy to sort through because it won't be on the main thread because it moves so fast. So it'll just be in that one place where you can find it. And as I go through this course, you'll be able to go back there and get the information that you need. So with that, 
let's jump into it. This is what really taught me about marketplaces. When I got into the storage auction business, I had a very, very good furniture background that became better because of the storage auctions. I knew that furniture is a need. Furniture is a need. When you are selling stuff that people need, it's a different ballgame. Now, this is something I don't really talk about on YouTube that much because we I was always trying to grow the business. You know, we you know, and the storage auction business can be feast or famine sometimes. And what I mean by that is you there was a six week stretch about the third year that I went out and there just was nothing to buy. It was weird. It was just. I can't even quantify it. It wasn't tax season. It was just this big period of time that I went to the auctions. It was nothing to buy. It was just very, very frustrating. We had customers. We it's like so I had to start sourcing from other sources. And this is where this will help you because when I started sourcing from other sources, when the storage auctions came back, I never stopped. And one of the sources was I went to the Paramart and on the sixth floor, if you've been to Atlanta or to the Paramart, you can buy jewelry. And there was this guy, his name was Sarkis, he had the shop. And I started buying gold jewelry at like 480 per gram for 10 carat and making 200 times my money on eBay by putting up very unique designs, taking very good pictures. That went on for about four years and I just kept doing it. Then eBay went through one of those shifts where it became very hard. And another thing I used to sell was Invicta watches. That went very well. And I was doing this as well as the storage auction business because you never know. You never know. Most of the income came from storage auctions. I would say like 90 percent. But this 10 percent was nice because if I wanted to do something that my partner didn't agree with, I had funds that were not generated from the main funds because I use my own money for this stuff. And, you know, she was cool with it. She's like, oh, you know, you're using your own money. So if it goes boom, it doesn't impact me, which I think is very fair. But it went really well. <laughs> and she's like, hey, I want a piece of the action. So I brought her in and I started using company money after it got to a certain level. But what I learned is when you source the right products, and when I say that, it's not high end products or low end products, it's what is an established marketplace. There's an established marketplace for watches. On Facebook, in one of my e-commerce groups, a guy was just like, don't bother wearing watches. You know, when uh, Samsung came out with the phone watch and the guy was just like, why? And I had to show him that sports watches, high sport watches alone, like fuel and these other things is a billion dollar business. He didn't know that. So there, there's this marketplace that's already there and it's big and it's crowded. And a lot of people are like, well, man, there's so many people there that how can I fit in? If a market is huge then there's going to be sub markets of the main market and of the sub markets, there's going to be sub sub markets. And that's how I fit in with the Invictus because I took great pictures and only bought the high end Invictus or the, the cheapest one was the Lupa, but that was very popular. And for a while I could get them at a really good price, but I learned to source really well because of that six week period where we just couldn't find nothing. It, it was just, when you build a customer base, you have to have products, which goes back to your eBay and your Amazon. You got to have some stuff. So I was selling things that I could get. And the cool part about this, especially with the jewelry and the watches, I frequently could sell them and not have them in inventory. I could have them kind of on hold like, hey, would you hold this? I'm coming down Friday, but it would be Monday and I will go ahead and list the item on Sunday. <laughs> So I, I had a certain situation there and then I would purposely forget to go get it Friday. And if it sold, I would get it Monday morning and just take it straight to the airport post office and ship it out. I had all the packing materials and labels and stuff in my vehicle. So what I learned from that is because at one point during the dark, you know, it was there was a point where I was getting run up. We were kind of really starting to separate from the big dogs and people were just running the shit out of me and their margins just went Ooh. and because I instituted this and I was selling new furniture done this stuff we had a month 
where they ran the shit out of me and I didn't make any money. Did not make any money. That was the worst month I ever had in the storage auction business. Probably spent $60,000 and got $58,000 back. <laughs> but uh, between the furniture, the jewelry, and the watches, did about another eighty. dollars Now, that wasn't the same profit margin because out of the eighty, only made about $20,000 profit. But it saved the month because it was actual profit and not just what we like to call in the store charts in business when someone buys a unit and pays too much you're just trading money you buy a unit for 1500 and you make 1500 or you buy a unit, and that's good that's good at worst you buy a unit for 1500 you make 1700 at that point you're not trading money you have lost money and i never let that go because then the next month was a 180 degree radical departure from that and i was like ooh, and then someone just said don't stop doing what you're doing don't stop it and now that's the thing is I learned to become a source monster. That was my responsibility in our business. I was logistics and I was sourcing. So I was always looking for stuff. I would source five to seven days a week because many people don't like this. You know, since I'm an internet marketer now and I sell information, I don't have to have inventory. But I always ran because of that six week period. I always had six weeks inventory on hand, which means that we, you know, we could shut down and we could still sell for six weeks because it's, I mean, we were bone dry when it happened. That was another problem. It was very scary. We had warehouse, we had bills and there was nothing to buy and there's nothing to buy. You can't sell anything. So that's my story. That's where I became the source thing. That's why I spent so much time tweaking eBay, tweaking this stuff because I would buy storage auctions during the day, and then at night, I would study eBay, and I found out that there were so many things that you can do with eBay, and you can still do some of them, but my recommendation, and I'm just going to be very official with this, is you move away from eBay completely. If you have to sell on eBay, take your minimum item price up to 100 bucks. If it's not 100 bucks. Don't mess with it. If it's 80 bucks, it's a pass. Get your stuff to 100 bucks and above because the hassle factor is going to be the same for this $100 item as it will be for this $5. Actually, that's not true. The $5 item may actually cost you more hassles than the $100 item because people are nuts. So my official recommendation is to move away from eBay. If you still got to do it, understand I'm not going to beat you. I'm not going to talk bad about you. But my official position is, as a reseller today, I want you to move away from eBay. It may take a year or two. It may take some time because you got stuff up there. You got to sell it. And it's the only place you can sell certain things. I'll be realistic. But there is a much better way to do it because with the information that I'm going to teach you, you're going to stop buying for profit and you're going to start buying for markets. That little nuance is huge because say you're the garage sale and you see this thing. And you kind of sort of know about this thing and you know that you can get it for five bucks and this thing may go for ninety dollars. So at that point, you're buying for profit, which is not bad. The downside is one off. You get this thing for five bucks, you sell it on eBay, you make eighty dollars profit, maybe seventy eight fifty after all those expenses and shipping and you're done. But when you buy from markets, you can develop what I call repeat customers. One of our markets in the storage auction business was linens, towels, rags, curtains, because we had a group of people, my Latino brothers and Latino sisters, that would come in there every weekend and clean that stuff out at a dollar a piece. Even at 50 cents a piece, we were making anywhere from four to six thousand dollars just from serving that market. I would get towels. I would get this stuff from other people who would just throw them away. Because they had value, but their value was such a hassle to extract it that they just said, forget it, I'll throw it away. And I scooped up a lot of free inventory to flip into that marketplace. When you buy from marketplaces, you then become you can become a resource. You can become an authority for that marketplace. And you can do it for two marketplaces, you can do it for three marketplaces. Because when I was selling the watches, I kind of became one of the eBay guys way back in the day because Elio was one. 
And I had to create a new ID because it was so mi- much mixture. It was like there's these high end watches and then there's this blender. You know, it was just crazy. But I worked it and I put up the watches. And the thing is, you have tools that I didn't have. You can, I'm going to give you an example. Say you decide to, uh, to buy Hummel figurines as one of your things. We're going to talk about it because you're going to have more than one. So you get the, the Hummel figurines. So you have this deep knowledge base of Hummel figurines. And you go to the Hummel figurines chat board. And you go to the Hummel figurine blogs. And then you create a Hummel figurine YouTube channel. You're not going to get a ton of traffic. But the traffic you do get will be highly targeted. And once these people are convinced that you know about Hummel figurines, they'll buy from you. You have YouTube, you have blogging. And what you can do is have your products on a website. And it's like, this is what I sell. And I'm talking about apart from eBay because you've become an authority. You know about this. You can do this with uh, the Walt Tools. You, you know, except it would be broader because you're like, well, I've got these DeWalt tools and this is what it does. You could do like a review on it. There's so many possibilities. But part of that is buying from marketplaces is fundamentally different than buying for profit. And understand profit is not bad. It's just limiting because you're always starting over. You're always starting over. And then you can't take advantage of that huge effort it takes to make a sale by extending it into a customer who comes to you every month or maybe every quarter or maybe every year. When you have that, over time it builds up because I saw that with the dollar section because we created that marketplace and we fed that marketplace and it was just re, you know reoccurring revenue every month. It, it just kept coming in, just kept coming in. So that's what I want to teach you is how to buy for your marketplaces. Now, the most important part of that is how much? How much money do you want to make? That's a very simple question that many people do not have an answer for. When you figure out how much money you want to make, then you are better equipped to ask yourself what you're going to sell. I'll give you an example. Say you're married and you have 2.8 kids, you know, the kids growing, and a dog, and you have a house. And your monthly nut is just say three thousand a month, but you got kids, so you know that you always need money for them. So you really want to take your monthly nut up to four, you know, just even though you don't need it, you want to just say four thousand has to come in every month. So you've got that, okay? That's four thousand every month, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the math on this. So four times twelve is forty-eight thousand. So in your mind, it's like, okay, I need to make forty-eight thousand. But whoa, whoa, whoa! You you're a business owner, and money doesn't come in like it does with a job. So really, you gotta double your math. So you double that up to ninety-six thousand dollars, because even if the fluctuations of income doesn't, you know, it won't hurt you because you've moved your number up to ninety. Like I said, ninety six thousand dollars, but your monthly nut is still four thousand. When you write down a goal and you have numbers, two things happen: you come under or you go over. So you go, you get close. You've doubled your monthly nut, even if you kind of just like really just like ah, it was bad month. I didn't hit my goal of eight, but I made six. You made six, but you still made your four. So that's why how much money do you want to make is so important because then it depicts your products. Now, going to another number, say you you want to make two hundred thousand a year gross sales, which is going to give you profits of about one hundred and twenty thousand, which makes it even twelve thousand a month. So you're like, okay, but you sell marbles. And you sit down with your pen and paper and it's like, I sell marbles. Okay, I got these marbles. I would have to sell a million marbles. To, no, that's not going to work. Then that prompts you to think, okay, what product can I find to serve a marketplace? So this is how it works. And he's like, okay, well, I'll just still do the marbles, but I'm going to back that down a little bit. Then you, you do a little research and then you go, hmm, I know a lot about 1966 Mustangs. 
you got one in your garage, you, you, you remember the club, then you start noticing that when you are out, because this guy that you pass going to work every day, he's got a rusted one in his backyard. And you're just like, man, that car would be great if someone fixed it up. And you're like, hey, let me go see if I can get that car cheap. So you go get the car and the guy gives it to you because he just wants it gone. The car has some rust, a little Bondo, a little stuff. The engine's great. You can redo it. You've actually got, you know a guy that's got the upholstery. So in six weeks, you fix that bad boy up, get it painted, and sell it for $20,000. See, that, that's what you got to start thinking like. this. Um, I'm going to go to a garage sale, and I'm going to go to a thrift store. And I'm also going to say that one of the reasons that I'm leaving that stuff out is it's going away. It is my prediction, and I'm rubbing on my crystal ball, that in the United States of America, because I've got international people doing this, that in five years, it's going to be very hard to go through a thrift store and get a retail arborage job. I mean, retail arborage deal. You might still be able to do it. No, actually, I'm going to back away from that. With corporations becoming more and more efficient and with faster manufacturing, to, you know, things are coming. Stores are not going to have to overbuy. I mean, someone's going to figure that out. So there's not going to be this excess inventory. And when there's not this excess inventory, there will not be these retail arborist deals. Um, maybe seven to 10 years before that's disappeared. And technology is going to hit that. It's not going to be that the stores are going to get smarter per se. It's just technology is going to make them more efficient. And when they become more efficient, there's not going to be this surplus stuff. There's Because that's how you get these deals. You get the store. And someone's like, wow, you know, we've got all of these fur balls and we got them at 90 bucks and we need to blow them out. But you go across the country, they've already sold out. So if you're a smart cookie, you go buy those fur balls for five bucks and put them in the Amazon FBA and they're selling for 75 and you're making a lot of money. That's going to disappear. Seven to 10 years, that's going to disappear. So another thing about this is I want to condition your mind that this is a long term process. This isn't like, OK, I'm going to do this in December and then February, I'm going to be making all this money. No, I'm going to do this in December and next December comes around. I'm going to have a viable business that can support my family. And then in December after that, because you're going to be keeping year to date numbers, you're going to like, wow, December 2014, I did 25,000. December 2015, I did 70. And then around that three to five year mark, you're just going to be like, wow, this thing is really rolling because that's what I want to condition your mind for. And that's what I want you to understand that if you do this step by step and stop buying for profit and start buying for markets, it's going to be more sustainable income. And you're not going to have to work as hard because once you find the right product and you'll always be sourcing because marketplaces change, you'll always be sourcing, but you will be able to have some income coming in while you're looking for other stuff versus being on that. I buy, I sell, I buy, I sell, I buy, I sell, I buy, I sell. It, it, it's, I've been on that and it's a high because when you get something really, really cheap and you sell it for something really high, it's a, it's an orgasm. It's a, it's a financial orgasm in your pants. You're just like skeet, skeet, skeet. And you're just jerking because it feels so good. But the thing is, you're working harder than you have to. I did that for years, which resulted in some health issues. Um, still on the way I'm my partner because she didn't smoke. She, I mean, she didn't eat. She ate. She was five nine, 130 pounds. She ate healthy. The woman ate liver, so I don't know why she got colon cancer. But I worked extremely hard, and I want to impart information to you where you can make as much money as possible and not kill yourself because. I want you to think about it. if you're currently doing sourcing where you're going out looking for something really cheap to flip for max profit. You keep doing it. You, you like I'll give you a great example of something real simple. Say you have um, you do laundry. You Yes, you can still do that in 2013. Say you go around your neighborhood and you, you have no money, but you have a house and, you know, you got unemployment coming in. And you're just like, hey, I'll do laundry every week. And I'll do you know, as much laundry as fits in this bag for 20 bucks. And I'll bring it back to you. You go out and find like, you know, 10 people that stick with you and you do it every week. 
That's two hundred dollars. That's eight hundred bucks a month. And if you just add one or two new customers a month to replace some who would move, disappear. So one leaves, like one leaves every two months, and you're adding more. You'll get your income up to fifteen hundred, two thousand, and it'll just be recurring revenue. Uh, that's one of the things that I want to impart to you because I know how important it is and how good it is for you, your business, your family. Give you an example. When you have reoccurring revenue, and if you're an entrepreneur, you know what I'm talking about. It's very hard to take a vacation because when you leave, you feel that you're losing money. You may or may not be, but that's how you feel. And it makes it very hard for you to break away. And if you do break away, you can't enjoy yourself. But if you develop some reoccurring revenue models or you start buying stuff from marketplaces, you can take that vacation and know that you're still making money, which reduces your stress level and you can actually vacation. So that big question of how much money you, you, you want to make is super huge because that predicates everything else. You want to make a million dollars? You can't mess with marbles. You can't mess with Furbies. You can't mess with... Uh, yo-yos unless you're Hasbro or something so it's like okay well I need to up my price points and believe it or not I think I saw that average price point on Amazon and eBay was I think Amazon was like $29 I know eBay was $29 I think Amazon was like 40 so you know do the math you had a $50 product right once you sold the product you realize say uh, $38 profit because the product cost you 12 bucks you sell 10, that's $380. You sell 100, that's 3800 bucks. You sell 1000, that's 38. I mean, it's $38,000. See, that's 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 just a $50 product. So if you have a $100 product, and that's that's one of the things that I got to really enjoy and learn when I was selling furniture. I would have $4,000 sales on eBay. And I would have $6,000 sales on eBay. It was real stressful because you're dealing with furniture and shipping, a lot of bad things can happen, but to me, it made dealing with the potential hassle much easier because I only had five furniture deals go really funky. And when I say funky, I had a chargeback. Uh, another funky, I had I got sued because the armor was damaged and they it took my supplier forever to get me a replacement. And the guy got really impatient. And then some other stuff happened. And this would be out of roughly maybe... 800 furniture deals on eBay. So the hassle, but once again, I went into it knowing how to ship furniture, whereas most people have no clue what LTL is or how to do blanket wrap. So I had intimate knowledge on how to get it there. But how much money do you want to make is incredibly important to the future of your profits. Now, this is another step that I recently did. It's 2009 that I want you to do now. I want you to spend more time seeing where you want to be and versus commiserating where you are. I've been really poor. I've been very, very poor. I know what it's like to go to bed hungry. I know what it's like to not be able to do everything that you want to do for your children. You know, you, you get the basics done. You get, you, you get They get food. You have shelter toy something but the extras it's just too it's it hurts you as a parent it really does it hurts you as a parent so i know being in that situation sucks big monkey balls and when you just it's just it's on you so much that it's hard to not think about it all the time because it's something that never leaves you it's with you in the morning it's with you at night so with you in the morning you see them and it's, it's just very hard and this will be the reverse engineer as you become to sit down and start thinking about, man, you know, the end of the month, all the bills are paid. I got 10 bucks. It's very, very hard. But I want you to really summon all your mental powers. And when that moment hits, I want you to see money in your bank account. I want you to see that all the bills are paid and there's a lot of money in the bank and your kids have everything that they need and a lot of what they want. Because you can't give your kids everything they want, but a lot of what they want. I want you to reverse engineer your knife because wherever you are now, if you're on that path, great. If you're not, I want you to sit down as part of this course and ask yourself, what kind of life do I want? You know, if you're married, do you want this house? If you um, you want to go on trips, I want you to just really think about this stuff.
because once you start putting it on a goal sheet, you it becomes more real. And I recently walked a friend through this who wanted to travel to five countries. Her mind was she needed all this money. I said, no, you don't need all this money. You need information. So over a course of three months from getting certain credit cards, like the Chase Sapphire had this killer deal, she was able to travel these seven com- these seven countries and then half of it she got free because she did some blogs she she responded to some blogs and she has special skills and you know she just you can do you know that you can uh, become an event planner and call up a hotel and say look i am planning an event uh i'm fairly thinking about coming to your air you know can i can i see your facilities a lot of hotels will comp you yeah a lot of people don't know that if you go ahead and print up some cards and get a website that says event planner, a lot of hotels will comp you because they want your business because those um, conferences bring them a lot of money. And she got three of these trips because she quit. Now, this is the thing I had to do. I had to do an LLC. She's here in Georgia, 130 bucks. Uh, print up some business cards and put up a blog and a Facebook page, get all her friends to like it. And, she got three trips out of that. She thought she's got to do all this stuff. So that's another part of Hustle University is hustling yourself out of old thought patterns. Because some of the things that you have on your life map, things that you want to do, you might be able to do right now, but you're not thinking you can do them because you need all of this money. And once again, what I say is you need information. Sometimes you need money, but more often you need information. So I really want you to really, really think about your life because one of the things I did poorly was I didn't think about my life as much as I thought about the money and getting out there and buying and pissing off the clampets and doing all the other stuff. You know, now I think about my life, which is really different because money is important. If you live in the United States of America, it's very important. Um, pretty much it's very important. You live anywhere in the world. But when you Create your life plan, you know, design your life. And for those of you who are here, you're going to get to the design of your life webinars too. It makes more impact and robust in your life. You find yourself smiling just sitting at home because you're happy versus always stressed out because you've changed your thinking. Whatever problems you may or may not have, they're still there. But you are looking at them differently and you have a plan on how to address them, which reduces your stress level, totally reduces your stress level. Now, this is another part of resale, and this goes back with sourcing. Needs and wants. You can do both because people will pay a lot of money for both. But if you are struggling or you're just starting, I would have you work on things that people need versus what they want. That's how you can build a durable marketplace because take shoes. You can do an eBay ID on shoes and high end shoes. Because remember, you're doing eBay. It's got to be past 100 bucks. You can create a YouTube channel. I found one that was like kicks. And the guy was just, he loves shoes. He spends outrageous of money. There's a huge community around shoes. Athletic shoes. New shoe comes out. The new Jordans. The new LeBrons. There's a huge market for those people. Huge. And you can flip shoes. You can buy them. You can get them new. You can create a YouTube channel. You can get rep. There's just so much you can do. But that's a want. For some of those people, they feel it's a need. But for most people in this country, 50% of the people in this country are poor or barely making it. That's half the country that's coming in. This country has 310 million people. So we're talking about 160 million people, either poor or barely making it. Then you go up to just okay, we can probably say 70%. So with such a large base of people that will have to satisfy needs. And I will give you the psychology. You have people who are poor that will buy a big screen television before they will pay rent or have their hair done or take a trip before they pay their rent. These people are more predicated on their wants. And I got what's up there, (laughs) but I'm going to leave it. But that should be wants. It could be what's. But you have that group of people who are really just... They will do that. So you can, you can, like I said, you can do both. But if you're just starting out and you know a little unsure, or let's just say, it, let's give you some more parameters going. Like, say you have a job, uh, you have a job and you have money coming in, 
you have way more leeway than someone who is doing this full time because you're doing it full time. It's very real. You must make money. There is no oops. I didn't sell nothing this month. Oh, yeah, but I'm getting that check every two weeks. No, no, no. You don't have that situation. So you really got to make it happen. And we're going to talk about another part of how to get stuff for free. You know, for those you don't know, I have a, there's a new Cameron in the world. And I just did this today. Uh, Simone wanted a rocker. And I was like, I'm not paying 600 bucks for a brand new rocker. Not when I know how Craigslist works. This morning, I started searching. I found six first person. Two people got back to me really quick. And one guy had one for 150 went and saw it. Stained. It had some dust on it because it's been sitting in this basement for a few years. But it worked perfectly. And I said, like, hey, dude, this thing's stained. I got to get steam clean. All this. No, not really. All I got to do is take a broom to it, put some resolve, make sure it's freshened up, let the cushions dry, and it's like as good as new. And that's exactly what I did. And I talked him down to 50 bucks. So understand, <laughs> you, you got a lot of stuff that's going on out there. But what you can do is develop a plan. Because one of the things that I'm doing both of these at the same time, designing your life and the resale matrix is many people get caught up in, I need money. And they think that money will change their life. If you don't change your thinking, I don't care how much money comes in your life, your life will not change. <clears throat> you will just do the same stuff at a bigger level with more money. That's that's it. That's it. You you will be the same person and you will do the same things just on a larger level. So if you really want your life to change, you got to get to that designing and those inner parts. But like I said, you know, gave you some criteria. I mean, the criteria about where, where you should go needs or wants or what's. <laughs> All right. Now let's get to the nitty gritty. This is the most important thing you would do. This is the biggest thing that you would do as a reseller sourcing because nothing starts before you get something. And as the old adage goes, you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. It's very true for the following reason. The price that you pay for your buy will never, ever change. The price that you hope to sell for? <laughs> It could change drastically. And I can give you an example. Say you got an iPad, right? The iPad 2, you're getting ready to sell it. You got a little uh, late. You could sell it for 350 Then, whoa, what? You missed it. Apple announced they've got new iPads out. That item immediately went down 100 bucks. You're going to sell it for 250 That happens every day. New stuff comes out. Better stuff comes out. I was looking at this Sony camera for the YouTube. But I didn't get it because it was more of a want and not a need. And I was like, okay, you really don't need it. You want it, and you're not really sure. And I looked at it, and it was 700 bucks, like six ninety nine. dollars Three weeks later, I was in Target and walked by. Thing was on clearance for $400. And it was just like, wow. So with, with the sourcing, you have to become a source monster. Because, see, this is the thing. In the beginning, if you don't know about a lot of stuff, and you don't know about a lot of things, there's this big information gap. There's this huge learning curve. So if you're not making a lot of money, I want you to spend time to, you know, researching marketplaces. And when I say marketplaces, I'll give you a few examples. A defined market marketing, excuse me, a defined marketplace in literature is PD, police procedures, mystery, romance, how to, those are defined marketplaces that have been around a long time and have a large group of people that belong to those marketplaces. Another marketplace that may seem odd, BMW drivers. There is a marketplace of people who would drive nothing else but BMWs. That's a marketplace. Another marketplace are uh, shooting the gun people. You, you hear all the debate. There's a group of people that, I know people with 10, 15, 20 guns. And they're not police officers. I'm not kidding you. There are people that the gun thing is huge. It's very huge. I think actually uh, with a lot of things going on, you might be wise to stack up with 30, 40 guns for future resale. But that's a marketplace. Another marketplace that may shock you is children's clothing. 
if you have kids, you already know this. Um, you know, I do okay, as you know, but I have not bought one stitch of clothing from a new store. I've gotten my daughter maybe 100 articles of clothing. And at seven, I mean, I'm, like I go to Goodwill and get seven pieces, eight pieces for 20 bucks every day, all day long. Because, you know, they're going to grow. So that's in the marketplace. Another one that's really kind of interesting and I will give credit where credit is due, is uh, the Bonafide Hustler. He had mentioned this. I kind of knew, but I never really got into it. But activity, act, you know, athletic strollers for people who want to run with their kids, that's a marketplace. They buy, sell, trade. It's a huge marketplace. Uh, bicycles, going back to the same guy. Now, I did know about that because I got a lot of, like, Cannondales out of units. I got a lot of high-end bikes, Trek. I got stuff that taught me that people are very passionate about their bikes. Now, this is kind of on that thin line between a want and a need. If you are a biking hobbyist, your bikes are a need. Can't be a biking hobbyist without the bikes. So that's another marketplace. Uh, there's another marketplace for collectible dogs. So, so there are marketplaces that you may know of, but you never really thought of them as marketplaces because you were thinking, Oh, I like, you know, cowboy dolls, just throwing it out there. And you really haven't explored how many other people like cowboy dolls. Uh, a former student of the Hustler Mindset Project, I actually walked her through the marketplace of makeup tutorials. It's huge on YouTube. If you have any sense of style and some discipline and willing to work for about two years, you can land yourself some serious money from uh, makeup advertising. I mean, seriously. I'm talking about, I know someone who has a channel that has maybe twice as many views as I do, but she does tutorials and her AdSense check is way bigger than mine, way bigger than mine because of the demographics. Oh, think of sourcing as marketplace development. Don't think of it as buying and selling. It's like, okay, here's this marketplace that needs cowboy boots. Where can I get the most cowboy boots for the best coin? Because once you feed the marketplace, because they understand the marketplace is already there. You know, just like we have to eat every day as human beings. That's an established, you know, people are going to buy groceries. They're, you know, you have Publix, Kroger, whatever food stores in your town, they're duking it out. Established marketplace, never going anywhere. And that's another long term strategy. If you can find products for a marketplace that's never going anywhere. I mentioned children's clothes. People are going to keep having sex and having kids. It's never going anywhere. Think of stuff that's not going to change. I was going to say cars. You know, cars probably in our lifetime are not going to change a whole lot. I think they're going to become better. and We'll see some stuff that may weird us out, like the car that's past us on the highway and there's nobody in the driver's seat. But just start thinking, what do you know about, about a marketplace that's never going to change? People are going to always get like coins. And some of these things with marketplace development will take time. And that's one of the things that I want to stress to you. This is not going to happen overnight. I'm not that guy that's like, it's easy and you can, no. Because if it's easy, and this is some things that you should understand. If it's easy and someone's marketing it all over the place and there's a lot of people in it, the information that you get from that source is going to be worthless faster. I'll be honest. At some point, my information is going to be obsolete that I'm giving you. And it is. That's why you have to continue to learn. That's why that's why this Hustle Mindset Project is this big thing, because you have to keep learning. Because I know there is an expiration date for everything, because the only constant is change. So you, you have to keep looking for those sources, which brings me to the pre-source checklist. Why are you going to sell what you want to sell? You know, the first thing is to get money. OK, and there's some people who become billionaires just chasing dollars, but they had resources. I want you to be a little bit better than that. Say, give you an idea. Say uh, you get in the clothes. And it's like I'm going to sell clothes, to make money, but I'm going to give like 10 percent of the stuff I give away to people. You know, something like that, because that stuff comes back to you. Trust me. Trust me. It really does. So during your pre-source checklist goes back to. Does this stuff work with my lifestyle? There are people who are diehard anti-gun people. Can't be selling guns if you hate guns. Or you can't be selling gun paraphernalia. Or 
you know, say uh, I'm different in the regard that I didn't get weird when I sold the clan stuff I got from the guy who was a judge. He was a dragon in the clan. And he had all kind of manuals and stuff in there. And one person was like, you can get killed touching that clan stuff. I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to sell the shit out of this stuff. And that's what I did. But if you're really sensitive, what you sell, what you do, who you sell, who your marketplace is, all of that must jive with who you are. Because when I came on YouTube, I had many people in my ear like, don't tell them it's that hard. You'll sell more. Don't tell them that hard. I couldn't do that. Didn't want to do it. Never came to me because if you've ever been in a storage unit and got hit over the head by a canoe or walking out of a unit, then something slid out of a spot and you tripped and landed on your face. I'm not going to lead somebody into some, this area when I know bad stuff can happen. Water, I've had a washer. I don't know how the hell they stacked that, but I had a washer. You know, it didn't fall completely on me, but it moved and I was able to catch it. That's some scary stuff because people pack like idiots in these units. But make sure that whatever you're selling jives well with your life plan now this is really really huge this is this is a big thing uh, most of the people that i see on youtube that talk about it and in groups are opportunistic hustlers they're not strategic there's no strategy there's no st strategic hustling whatsoever none just I'm going to get some stuff, get some stuff, get some stuff, get some stuff. That's why you have a lot of people who are trying to do exactly what I'm doing. But this is this is kind of a life goal. I've always wanted to write books and help people and put information out. So this is something that's really in line with my life plan. And I actually make less money doing this than I did when I was in the storage argument. business. So put it what it's your and I should be honest about that. I get a lot of wealth from this. And if you remember my videos, there's emotional wealth, there's health as wealth, there's a lot of wealth. So on the fiscal part, which gets better every month, I'm not where I was in the storage auction business, but I actually see myself in 2014 getting to that point and passing it. But I have a lot of wealth in terms of time and freedom. And that's some other stuff that you have to discuss with yourself on your life plan, because if sitting at home with your husband, wife, whatever you have is more important than money, then your life plan is going to dictate that you do things, sell products, create situations to make that happen. It doesn't make sense for you. And that's why the person who was in the hustle mindset is former, because all the stuff that she wanted to do seriously just conflicted with her being a good mother and wife. And she's like, I can't do this. I want to do it, but it's not really working for the larger plan. And that's why you got to have that life plan. Now, with the optimistic hustling and the strategic hustling, let me give you some examples. Um, someone goes on YouTube and they see that someone is selling hats or no, let's just say they're, they're selling vibrating chinchillas, right? They've got vibrating chinchillas. Vibrating chinchillas are hot. They are super hot right now. But you can get them low and you get yourself a vibrating chinchilla for 10 bucks and they're selling for $100 on eBay and $125 on Amazon every day, all day, all week long. And you, you go out and you get yourself some vibrating chinchillas. Then you, you stock up and then, whoa, the market is flooded with vibrating chinchillas. So now you can only get 50, but that's okay. Then next thing you know, you only get 48 and the market just kind of bottoms out. That's what happens when you do opportunistic hustling. Now, when you do strategic hustling, which is what I did with the office furniture, I knew the marketplace. And for a long time, I made a lot of money because I had a plan. And I, I became the guy that always bought office furniture. Didn't care how crappy it was because I was ingratiating myself to the storage facility people. Uh, there's some units I cleaned out. I made no money but I made a lot of relationship currency. Went a long way when I got in the jam. So with strategic hustling is sitting down and creating a situation of finding products or services to take to establish marketplace, because that's when you can get the reoccurring revenue. There are so many things that you can do. Uh, there's a shop in my neighborhood, nothing but bunt. They make these bunt cakes. I have been in there so many times. I've recommended that place to so many people. I can't tell you how much money they've gotten out of me. 
because I bought stuff to give to people. I bought stuff. And it just I can't tell you. And that's why I want you to get yourself. And this is the beauty. It doesn't have to be this huge thing. Say you got your current hustle going on and it takes time to make a shift in what you do. And your you know, you add to something like cupcakes or cookies or laundry, you something. There's something you can probably do. And that's like only 200 bucks. But from a person who's been in a jam, 200 bucks could be the difference of paying a rent on time or paying a $200 late fee or whatever the late fee is. There was times in my former life when I was not financially astute enough to have a savings account that because I got paid a day or two late, I was late on my rent and I had to pay a late fee. I think it was like $80, which was crushing at the time because what they did was automatically assume that you were going to be a deadbeat and they went ahead and filed the the uh, papers, get your ass kicked out. So you had to pay all those fees. And you're already behind. That stuff kills you. So what I'm saying is if you create something that's small now, because just because it's small now doesn't mean it won't be larger later, that that extra money can be huge to your family situation. So with strategic hustling is essentially what I talked about in the beginning, finding stuff for established marketplaces and finding your position in there. Looking Instead of looking for, you know, and I, I don't hate collectibles. Let me be very, very clear. I don't hate collectibles. But collectibles are so random and the price drops. It's just very hard unless you're really good with collectibles and that's all you do. And you have a large enough inventory that's going to guarantee that you're going to hit your monthly nut. It's just it's hard. It's just really, really hard. Um, I, there's one person you, you're going to see him on the first hustler profile. He's in the, he's in the Netherlands. and He does a lot of really cool war stuff. And it's just like, I don't know that marketplace over there, but he does. And I think, you know, something like that's a little different because it depends on how rare it is. If you're doing stuff that's pretty common, it's going to be hard to make money. But your strategic hustling is having a plan for your hustling just versus trying to hustle something just to, you know, to, you know, this guy said, I'm selling snapbacks. This guy said he's selling to you can look at that stuff. Now, let me give you an example of how to take a situation from someone who's an opportunistic hustler that found something on YouTube, right? They found something, they talk about it on YouTube. You sit down and go with a plan. I'm like, this guy's getting this. So what I'm going to do is go to Craigslist. I'm going to go to the I'm gonna Craigslist automation platform. I'm going to do all these searches. I'm going to find this. And then you're going to go to the next YouTube video and the next YouTube video. And you're going to watch 50, 60 videos. You're going to get all of these ideas of stuff that you know is selling. And you're going to start doing searches. And you're going to start putting that in the pipeline to sell. Now, that's strategic hustling. Because when you see people putting stuff out, I want you to look. Next time you're watching YouTube and you see someone talking, don't listen to what they're saying. Look at the background of where they live. Because if they can't live well, they're not actually telling you the truth about how well they're doing. Because that's one of the things that I've called a few people out on the guy called an asshole. It's like, how can you talk about you doing well when there's a roach crawling across your wall? A big one. I mean, Rodney was like, his antenna was like, I want to be in the video. Okay, I'm being facetious. But you, you know what I'm saying. With the strategic hustling, you've got goals. You've got your life plan. You're working on something and you're, you're not looking at one revenue stream. You're looking at building as many revenue streams as possible. You pull in your goal sheet. I want to build like I got one revenue stream or say you are married and there's a husband and a wife. That's two revenue streams, your salaries. OK, we want to add three more. How can we do that and start sitting down and digging into the inventory of your talents to figure out what can you do to create those additional revenue streams? But I know from experience, planners make way more money in the long term and they make it longer, they make more money and they make it longer than optimistic hustling. Now, this is going to be the thing that's going to stretch a lot of people really, really stretch, 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 stretch Just start stretching because you're about to be stretched for you to easily hit your nut. You need 100 items that you can consistently sell. 
Uh, there are people who have done really well with one or two, but that's very nuanced. They had a lot of information. If you can find 100 things, and this is what happens, because, you know, go, remember when I was talking about the drought? There'll be periods that you just won't be able to find certain things, and it's just the ebb and flow of the market. But if you got 100, every week you're going to find something. You're going to find something. You're definitely going to find something every week. And going back to sourcing is the most important thing that you do. If you're finding stuff at great price, at good coin, and you're selling it every week, every week you're generating revenue. And if you're generating revenue, you can have more options. So that's part of this. And that's why I said it's going to stretch you. It may take some of you all month to find 100 things. It may take some people all of 2014 to find 100 things. But I can guarantee you, if you can find 100 items that you can consistently sell, not an item that's one off, like take candy. Do you know that you can buy candy wholesale and resell it? There's, you know, this is for you to dig into you to figure out what you want to sell and what marketplaces you can serve. Because if you've got 100 things, every week you're finding something. Every week you're finding something. Later on in uh, Hustle University, this is a totally separate course. We're going to talk about creating your own products. Because, you know, well, like I said, going back to the new focus of Hustler University, there'll be these individual modules for people, and then there'll be new ones later on. But 100 items. I want you to find 100 items that you can consistently sell. The criteria is it's something that you can get cheap. It's something that you can get over and over again. And see, that's another thing. If you find something, say it costs you a dollar, but you can sell it for five and you can get it next day, but you can sell it that day. That's something that you can work with. Now, if you buy some for a dollar and it takes you 90 days to sell it, then no, that doesn't fit. But if it's something that you can flip really quick, I bought units and paid top dollar to only make, you know, five, six hundred bucks. But I know it's going to make that five or six hundred bucks the next day because I had someone I could sell it to. So you got to figure that in, too. If it's something you can sell very quick, it you don't have to worry about the margins as much as if you have to sit on it and if you have to warehouse it. If you can go someplace, like take bottled water. You ever been to an event and you always see these people in the corner selling bottled water? You know what they did? They went to Sam's that day and got a few cases. And they're selling it for a dollar, but a case of 24 bottles of the size, like 388 at, tar at Target. So when they those first three bottles are sold, bam, the other 21 and nothing but profit. So if you can find some situation like that where you can sell it that quick, that's another th way to go. All right, homework for now. The 100 things, that's going to take some time. You're not going to do that in a week. But this week, I want you to take a week, the whole week. Because this is going to be your Q&A session. And then the other week, there will be stuff that will be going under the resale matrix tab. But I want you to think about it. everything that you know about. I don't care how obscure you may think it is. If you know about guns, put it on the list. If you know about car parts, put it on the list. If you know about vibrating chinchillas, put it on the list. And then go see what the marketplaces are saying about this stuff. Because... There's all kinds of marketplaces out there where people are making money. And I love it. I totally love it. So think about that and, you know, just research if it's worth selling. Now, at this juncture, I'm going to uh, pop out of here and I am going to open up the floor to questions. So if you got any questions, just let me know if um Something happens to you after you see this again, because tomorrow this will be in Hustle University at some point. You can watch it again. You can put a question under the video because I'll put the videos. I'll, when you, you'll see, there'll be a way to be to communicate on that tab. You'll be able to communi communicate under the video and you can ask me a question and I'll answer it there. So that is pretty much this session. And like I said, I was crazy for doing this on uh, Football Sunday, but <laughs> a lot of stuff is going on. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask. And if not, I will shut it down in a few minutes. And then, um, like I said, you know, since you're in Hustle University, you can always ask. It's not a problem.
like I said, I am getting much better at getting back to people in a few days versus a few weeks like it used to be.